Let me, no, okay, we are live. Woo. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm it's good. Hours since I've seen you. I know, so many hours. The lighting in my kitchen is really, really atrocious. Sorry about that. No, you're fine. Look at, uh, so I was not expecting the lighting in my kitchen to be this bad, but hopefully fine. you'll still be able to see everything. So, um, tell me what do you, you're Irish, right? Yeah. Tell me your experience with, uh, with Irish food. I don't have any experiences with Irish okay. food, honestly, awesome. even though I went to Ireland when I was five. Yeah. So I remember nothing. Uh, and we cooked corned beef once mm -hmm. for St. Patrick's Day, corned beef and cabbage. Yeah. I do like cabbage more than the average bear. But yeah, cabbage is delicious. Yeah, that's it. That's really it. I mean, um, okay. I, I have more experience with Irish drinking. That's fair. Are uh, you drinking anything right now? No, just coffee right now. I, I I bought the supplies to do an Irish coffee, but maybe at lunch. Yeah, I also have the things to make an Irish coffee. And then I was so busy this morning, I forgot about it. Um, I mean, like, it's a work day. Yeah, unfortunately, but I definitely want to drink later. I bought some Guinness, um, but you know my dad's big into the black and tans. Oh, uh, so That's we a, have the spoon and everything. I, I have a lot of issues with the black and tans personally. Why? The so the black and the black and tans were the name of a British paramilitary group that killed a lot of Irish people in the, the 60s and 70s. So I, I, I don't have issues with the drink, but I have issues with the Oh name. my God, I didn't know. Yeah. Like Irish car bombs too, I, I feel kind of squeaky. Oh them. my God, I didn't know. Yeah. Uh, we yeah, should so, rename things. We should, like, okay, so. I get irritated when I see them. These things. Yeah. I get irritated when I see them on St. Patrick's Day menus. But yeah, I had okay. no idea. I mean, they're still delicious. So. Do you know what's big in California? I know you want to start your cooking show. Just no, a second. Okay. Do you know what's big in California? What? Um, they might be big other places too. I don't know. But that's my experience is uh, corned beef tacos. Oh, that's so good. a lot of bars because we are so well versed in tacos down there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And they're good. They're so good. They've got like, I guess I do have more experience in Irish. That doesn't really count as Irish food. But anyways, um, yeah. So tr try whatever you end up making meat wise. Yeah, today. I know that Sam is making a stew, which may not work out for this, but whatever your family is making meat wise, tr I challenge you to taco it tomorrow. Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm going to have a lot of leftover lamb, so maybe I will taco the lamb. Yeah, I don't think I think I have way too much lamb. Um, I want to talk about corned beef oh. though before we get started. Yeah, let me um, pull up my notes. I hope Ricky's going to show up too. Um, but I gotta keep an eye out. I think you said it was gonna be a little late, so I'm here for okay, you. Cool. Um, no, fine. we can, uh, we can get started. I'm adding the recipes as we speak to the blog post, which oh, you cool. can, which I'll link and then we can mention as a link, um, here once it's yeah. up. And then if we're going to record this and show it later, um, mm -hmm. we can definitely add the link to the description of the video. Um, yeah. so Sam. It is has some recipes to share with you guys, but she also is just going off of her own recipes too. So yeah. um, you can use the recipes that we link, or you can use the recipes that are slight, that are varied from those uh, that are Sam's own creation. As you watch this, yeah, we we have eight people watching, seven people watching right now. So um, yeah, so Hello, a lot everyone. of these, these recipes are things that I learned on my own uh, from family and and stuff. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna sort of uh th there's going to be some fudging but the those recipes are pretty close to what i'm going to be making so um i want to talk about meat first i can stop itching my nose <clears throat> so what we think of as irish cooking is actually irish american cooking which is cool um that it's like hence the tacos recipe. yeah hence the tacos but <laughs> uh would you believe me if, like, I told you that soda bread and corned beef were Irish American? I would believe you. Honestly, I think, you know, a lot of the stuff we think of as, like, a cultural food, we, how, how can you go that long yeah. being in America and not be actually, like, a regional American thing instead? Yeah. So, like, 
it's it's so interesting to me because um <coughs> this this period of of food that I'm going to be talking about today uh, obviously it has ancient roots but it it mostly kind of lies between like the 1600s and like the 1900s uh when uh while Irish people were coming over to America but it's it's the food that they were still eating in Ireland um and at the time in Ireland, beef was not widely available. You only ate beef when the cow died. Uh, dairy is a very big thing in Ireland or what it was during this time period. Um, and so like you didn't want to kill the cow to eat the beef unless the cow was already dead. Um, Irish food has like lots of butter and cream and cheese. Um, so instead of eating beef, they would eat pork or mutton or fish. There's a lot of fish. Um, I mean, Ireland is an island. It's surrounded by water. Um, lots of shellfish, too. Uh, corned beef, the idea of it actually comes from a 12th century Irish poem, but it's talking about bacon that's been preserved in honey. Uh, bacon is a really big thing over there. Wow. And yeah, right? So then all, you have all these Irish people who come to America, and beef is so plentiful here. Like, they even have cows that are only grown for their beef and not just for the dairy. Um, so they they made do with what they what was plentiful and what was cheap. So I I just I find that that that's really interesting. So today we're gonna be cooking yeah. lamb, um, because that was plentiful in Ireland during this time period. I also want to talk a little bit about potatoes because. Um. I'm just going to interrupt you really quick. I yeah. see somebody commenting on Facebook. I don't know. There's no name. Person who's commenting, I'm so sorry. It says a whole yeah, time. Facebook. I, there's no name in this uh, third party software we're trying out. And I can't type back. So I'm trying to get onto the Facebook. Oh, I can type back. Hi. I'm trying to the Facebook stream, though, so that I can interact with people just through chat without interrupting Sam's talking. No, it's all good. Oh, oh we both said hi. Okay, so yeah, um, so how do you feel about potatoes, Jess? Potatoes? Yeah. You mean Strawberry? my only love? Yeah. I love potatoes. They're yeah. so good. Yeah. Um, and I, I was doing keto for a while, mm -hmm. and you can't really potato on keto, and that's like, I, I, I can't, I couldn't do it for my whole life. Potatoes are just so versatile and they're in so many things and you can make them into so many things. And the best thing about them is they remind me of all the family meals um, because, mm. you know, of course we always have, there's always potatoes in, in some form or fashion. Yeah. Potatoes are amazing. Yeah. Um, not originally from Ireland. You, you probably knew that. Um, like tomatoes, they, they were brought from the new world, from the Americas. Uh, originally, they think there's like a lot of tubers in South America. They think that the potato that we know came originally from Chile. Um, and then eventually it wound up in Virginia in the 1600s. And then from there, it was brought to England and Ireland and France. And now Europeans love potatoes. Um, That's amazing. It's so, yeah. it's so crazy to trace the way things travel around the globe. Like we are not I mean, just we are not as insular as we all think we are, like culturally mm -hmm. at all. It's so cool to find that out. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and potatoes were, like, they became a staple food in Ireland because they grew so well there. They liked the, they liked damp soil. Um, and they became a staple food until the mid-1840s. Would you know what happened then? The potato famine. Yeah. So I want to talk real quick, since we're talking about food, I want to talk about the difference between a famine and a blight. Um, I, the, the correct word is potato blight. Um, oh, okay. a, famine, a famine means a shortage of all foods in a selected area, often due to crops failing or flooding or diseases or war. A blight means a specific crop has failed due to disease. Um, in this case, the disease is called phytophora infestans. Um, and Ireland was not the first place the blight showed up. It showed up, uh, the, the beginning, beginnings of it in Ireland were like 1842, but it flourished in 1845, um, and it showed up in France and England. And before that, it was in Mexico, New Hampshire, and even Grun Grunfeld's home state of Vermont. Um, 
So we want to, there's, there's a political reason why we want to use the word blight when we talk about potato blight. Um, the, the simplest reason is that other crops still grew in Ireland at the time, barley and wheat especially, but Ireland was the breadbasket for its neighbor and at the time its colonizer, England, and they would take those crops and ship them to be eaten by British people or shipped over the world to be eaten by the British army um, or eaten by colonizing British people who lived in Ireland. And native Irish people were only really allowed to eat potatoes, even though they grew the other crops. So when the blight happened, the British weren't just like, okay, well, uh, here's some wheat to supplement your failing potato crops. They, uh, they similar to a situation that happened recently in our history, they uh, feared that halting exportation of wheat and barley grown in Ireland would distort the market and ruin profits for merchants and landowners. So this was the potato blight became a famine and it was a politically motivated famine. So a lot of Irish people wow. feel very strongly about using the word blight versus famine. Yeah, <laughs> I bet. Um, yeah, it's also probably the reason that your Irish ancestors came to America. Right. 1.5 million people left the country over the first 10 years of the potato blight. Uh, it may not seem like a lot, but that was like a third of the Irish population. Um, and then another third of the population died because of the blight. So it's a very, very important political thing. And I, I brought it up because there's a lot of similarities between Irish and Jewish people, two cultures that are have been forced by their neighbors into repeated diaspora, diasporas and put in bad food situations. So I think it's important to talk about, um, especially since potatoes are a very big thing that we're going to be making today. Um, but let's get to cooking now that we've yeah. talked about the depressing stuff. So um, I'll be right back. I'm going to get my mom. So the first thing we're going to start are blahs. Um, and blahs are uh, bread from Waterford. They're like they're like yeast rolls. They're really tasty. Um, they usually come covered in like flour. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do when I put my yeast is we're just going to start some yeast, just like you would when you're making mead. Just going to activate it. We probably won't finish the blahs during the stream um, because it's going to take too long but I at least want to show you what the dough looks like um, and all that. Yeah, we can definitely post them later. Um, yeah. We'll have a group where we talk about, if you're joining us on YouTube or or seeing this later, we have a group where we talk about recipes and that includes food recipes, meat recipes. There's also a cocktail recipe that it goes with this meal that we recommend um, that we'd be sharing later on. Um, yeah. All of that stuff is going to be in the Mediax group. Um, our Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash groups slash MediaX. So come join us. Um, it's not all our self-promotion, I promise. Uh, any review on there of our products is always, like, we leave it on there even if it's bad. So, um, and other meteries and mead making and all that on there. So mm -hmm. um, Sam will post, and Sam's our uh, main moderator on the MediaX group. So Sam will be posting her food, um, whatever food we don't have time to show here uh, in the MediaX group. Um, and there'll be a link. If you're on YouTube, there'll be a link to come check that out. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, of course. So, sorry, my sink is running. I didn't prepare my water ahead of time. That's okay. We're just hanging so out activate, cooking. You activate, um, activate yeast for bread just like you do with me with a little sugar as a nutrient and some hot water just give it like a really like nice moist and warm environment to live in so so far what do we got we got um what is that that's my that's my blah i'm starting my blah that's uh yeast sugar and water but what did you just do oh i was showing the i was showing the inside of the bowl can you oh, see can't it? see can't see, can only see you. Oh, that's weird. Can only see the camera that's looking at you. Oh no, okay. All right, I can't swap my camera. But I'll hold it up so we can see. I thought we were using my good camera. That's we're okay. My, my crappy laptop camera. So you can kind of see it. 
Yeah. Um, okay. So, so far we've got yeast and water and and salt. a little bit of sugar. Sugar, not salt. Mm -hmm. Salt would kill it. Yeah. Salt what am I thinking? It. You're crazy. I work for a brewery. You're crazy. I'm crazy. Don't put salt with your yeast, kids. Until Don't later, until there's more stuff in there. So while that's activating, uh, hi. Uh, oh, Steve's here. Hi, Steve. Um, we're gonna get some other stuff started. I wish I had my good camera. So I'm gonna point this back towards my my tiny apartment stove. Um, so I spent like so long last night chopping up all this lamb. There's so much of it. The lamb. The lamb. There's like there's like four pounds of lamb. It's honestly too much. But um, I've never cooked lamb in my life. Oh, Ricky's here. Hi, Ricky. Hi. Hi. Oh, Eric Boo. Hi, Eric. Hello. Hi. Who's waving, buddy? Oh, he's waving. Hi. Oh, now we can see the whole. Hi. Hi, Brian. Welcome back. Ah! Hi. Yeah. We're just about to cook some lamb. You guys can see my back there. <clears throat> How's it going, Ricky? It's good. Uh, my arms are shredded, but not in like the I've been working out way, but in like in the I've been pruning 15-year-old uh, uh, brambles with a baby on my back sort of shredded. Oh, wow. That's exciting. Um, so we were talking about sort of the history of um, potatoes and Irish food and the type of uh, beef that would be traditionally used and how a lot of food that we think of as being Irish uh, is actually Irish American. Mm -hmm. Like corned beef and soda bread. Um, but we're going to make some real Irish food here. Um, so I'm going to sear my lamb um, on my stove before I put it in my crock pot. That way it will not be goopy once it cooks in my crock pot. There's, a, uh, there's an actual word for that. I don't remember what it is. Do you know what it is, Ricky? I feel like if anybody knew. It's known as reverse searing these days. Okay. Um, well, sorry. No, that's just true. Uh, uh, braising. There we go. Braising. Reverse okay. searing is when you do it the other way and you cook it and then you sear it. Oh, okay. Yeah, which is growing in popularity. Ah, okay. Interesting. So um, while the, that starts cooking, and it's going to take a hot second because there's a lot of lamb, uh, we're going to make some coal cannon. Do you guys know what coal cannon is? No. Is. No? Okay. So you, Wait, you're doing a food thing that Ricky's never heard of? I have heard not of heard. I would say I have not heard of most of the foods on earth when you think about it. I, I don't believe it. I guess that's fair. I don't believe you. Um, sorry, I'm passing around. That's I okay. I have, a, I have a little tiny, uh, I have a little tiny kitchen in my... The galley kitchen. You're the best. Yeah. I had a friend that lived in a house that someone bought from Sears, like from the catalog in oh 1915, back when you could buy houses from Sears, and mm -hmm. it was built with a true galley kitchen, so there was like, everything was flat, oh um, boy. and it took some getting used to. Um, especially when you're my size, but I could touch all of their cabinets from one spot without moving. It was great. Bragging. I'm, I've never you probably could too. I mean, it was a it was a true galley kitchen. Oh, okay. So um, I made my mashed potatoes ahead of time because they take a long time to cook. Um, and uh, I, I made them in a style called Chomp or Champ, which is where you uh, put green onions in them, basically. That's really it. That's all that chomp is. But we're going to make coal cannon, which is where you take chomp or champ and you add cabbage to it. And it gives the potatoes like a really interesting structure. You fry it next or is that the end? Nope. The cabbage is, goes in raw. Nice. And it's delightful. So I have my cabbage here. <clears throat> so I actually separated out, my, I cut my potatoes in half because we're also going to make box peas, which are my favorite Irish food. They're, um, 
they're potato pancakes, essentially. Um, you can make them on the stove. My, I make them for my friends a lot um, when we play the indie together, and they always go over extremely well. Yeah, potatoes. Fried potatoes always are amazing. That's where I thought you were leading with the other dish. I'm glad to know it's happening alongside. <laughs> yeah, so we'll be, well, there's, there's got to be a lot of potatoes. It's, it's just the thing. Um, Christine says her husband will be smoking the corned beef. That sounds delicious. The coal cannon, you usually top like shepherd's pie or cottage pie with it. Jess, do you know what the difference between shepherd's pie and cottage pie is? Is it the meat? Yeah. Shepherd's pie is lamb and cottage pie is beef. So what most people think of as shepherd's pie is actually cottage pie. So usually you put that on top of, uh, you put coal cannon on top of shepherd's pie. I'm gonna put it underneath my stew because that's how I like to do it. Just checking in on the lamb over here. Sorry, I'm just uh you take your time, buddy. I thought I was going to have to dart outside because I thought Nora missed the memo that I came in, but she's just having like a yelling discussion <laughs> with an imaginary friend. That's and I just started like put her hands on her hips and turn around and say something. I think she might be both <laughs> of the friends. Yeah. I was about to say, there you go, buddy. That's that's adorable. Adorable. Um, so while the lamb is cooking, let's make our box D mix. So I have mashed potatoes in here. And I'm basically just going to add, I'm going to turn mashed potatoes into like dough. Um, you use like baking powder, uh, all purpose flour, salt. Um, some people put grated potatoes in their boxies, uh, which gives it like kind of a, a nice texture. I'm not, I didn't do that today because I forgot to grate my potatoes. Um, and then you, you basically use buttermilk to fry the boxies. I also put a lot of cheese in my boxies because. That's who I am. I do not need to take that out. Um, yeah, you just want to like, you want to put like so much, so much cheese and flour into it. And I usually throw an egg in there. Some the recipes I'm looking at. Uh, don't call for an egg, but just basically want to make it so that it fries up really, really well. I need a spoon. I need a spoon. This, this is like the perfect thing. Every time I put him behind my back, he starts yelling because he can't see you. And then I, I might point him at the screen. He starts trying to talk to everyone. You say Aww. bye. Bye. You can talk to us. Hi. I'm going to go stir my lamb real quick. We'll be right back. Okie dokie. So with the, with the braising, you're not like cooking it all the way through. You're just kind of cooking it enough so that it's, it's not going to like absorb too much juice and get too mushy once you put it in the crock pot. Um, you can also make this do by braising the lamb first and then adding everything on the, on the uh, stove top. Okay, what's braising? Braising is like you just like cooking it at a high heat really fast, I guess. I don't know. I don't know if there's an actual definition. That's just how, uh, that's just what I learned. 
So the terms are brazing as a sear, initial seal, sear. Someone could Google this for me, but from what I was taught, it's an initial sear so mm -hmm. that you get the Maillard reaction before you slow cook something. Okay. Or to do it so that you keep uh, a tender center through the whole, um, yep, there you go, buddy. There they are. Um, through the liquid cooking process. Whereas okay. smothering is like that, but with a sauce. And that was from um, the rural south. I could be wrong. People will correct me in the comments for sure if I am. So I just added two cups of flour to my uh, my boxy mix here, which will just hopefully give it a little bit of a structure once we fry it. I should have picked a bowl with better sides because I'm making a giant mess here. Um, but it essentially turns the mashed potatoes into like a dough. And I'm actually going to use my hands to mix it because the spoon I have is not really working out for me. Okay. So I was doing a couple of behind the scenes things. I'm catching up with you now. So, um, you've got mashed potatoes so far, right? Yeah. So I made, I made cold cannon, which is in mashed potatoes with, with, uh, cabbage in it. Okay. And I'm making the dough for the boxies, which are fried mashed potatoes. So we have a lot of mashed potatoes. My lamb is cooking and I've got the yeast for my blahs started. My gosh, this is so much multitasking. You're so amazing. <clears throat> I'm sorry, what'd you say? I said, this is so much multitasking. You're amazing. Oh, thanks. I like to multitask when I cook. I don't like to have downtime. That's how the that's how the thought I'm is. impressed with your mise en place, having everything ready so you can actually do this all live. That's the most impressive thing to me. Oh, That's thank hard. you. I barely even have my coffee ready and she's got all this other stuff ready. <clears throat> I didn't want to be chopping on screen. But like that would be I know you were chopping lamb so much last night. I chopped so much lamb last night. I love your gorgeous little blue pan, by the way. My little what? Your little blue pan. Oh, thank you. I've got pan envy. I love that pan. It's a good pan. Ricky and uh, and Brian were just talking about pans earlier in the before you got to. Me. Did your right. fridge beep at you when it's open? Yeah. Oh my God, Greg would love that. Yeah. My fridge doesn't close all the way, so you have to like really muscle it and fight with it. It's an older, uh -huh. it's a much older fridge. Um, and so at night he has to check that it's closed before he can sleep. Yeah, I, I, I feel like it's good in theory, but I always feel like a really strong sense of shame when it's not closed and he yells at me. Okay, what does Brian say? Braising is a combination cooking method that uses both wet and dry heat. Typically the food is first browned at a high temperature, then simmered in a covered pot in cooking liquid. Okay. It's similar to stewing, but braising is done with less liquid and usually used for larger cuts of meat. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm going to try a braise later. I have this huge piece of beef. Uh-huh. It's like a, um, I don't know what do they call it. It's a, it's a roast, I guess, is what it's yeah. called on the package. Um, so I'm, I was just going to put it in my, like, Dutch oven thing. Do it. But what oh, should yeah. I put in with it? You can totally make this stew in a Dutch oven too. I can I put some meat in with it? Would that work? Uh -huh. Should I put You can braise in whatever liquid you want. What is what is best though from what it, what you know that I have? For braising? What's the best mead for braising beef? Mmm. So I only braise with I only do one. I don't want to. I don't want to um, perjure myself. <laughs> Generally speaking, there's only one mead I regularly use for cooking, uh -huh. and that is uh, Root of All Evil. I think it brings so oh. much to whatever I'm cooking. Okay. Compared to the other things that we have, um, I will do Vanir, but obviously only for very special occasions. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that I want to open Vanir for that, but I have some like. Valkyries that has a can cap on it that probably lost its combination by now. It's been in here a while. <laughs> Could use that. Um, 
just as a reminder for people, root of all evil is the ginger. It's um, not fine. I'm going to use this. I was going to say, too, root of all evil, um, when we posted asking people which meat they cook with the most, it won by, like, a vast margin. That's good to know. I'm, I'm part of the crowd. Um, I'm going to ask Ricky if you could do me a favor while Sam in the, in the, in the in-between parts, while Sam is working on something, mm -hmm. can you talk to us about today's cocktail for this event? Oh yeah. Let's hear it. it up. Do, 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 do. Everyone else also do their own hold music when they're looking things up. I was on with Comcast. No, but I, I, I hang out with you so much. I hear yours in my head when I'm looking for something. I hear Ricky go, do, 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 do. Uh, I was on with Comcast and he's like, I'm sorry, sir. Our system isn't working correctly. So I'm just going to be here. And like, I didn't even think about it and started doing hold music. And he's like, are you doing your own hold music? I was like, I, apparently I'm doing your hold music too. Sorry about that. <laughs> like, no, it's great, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Way better. You know, when you call someplace pretty often, like, like a doctor's office, for example, and the hold music is always the same. And it's like, you're sometimes maybe once you've had a bad experience while you were like impatiently holding and now that music just makes that feeling come back of that one time i bet other people share that experience though you I don't have that experience every time I, is a new time for you every time is a new frustration. you're so you're so good at being present Thank you know you. yeah i mean i don't know it, it, it's always just an opportunity to practice so here is oh this is my this is the first one i came up with so i wrote all these between 5 a.m and 6 a.m uh one day and i had to look at them later in the day when i was drinking to yeah. make sure that they were still good ideas i think my the best one was the one for this morning after a night of Purim drinking the idea of having a mug of tea a glass of valkyries and a glass of seltzer and just i like liked that the cocktail order. was not mixed it was Repeat yep. these three drinks in order next to each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this was the first one I came up with the Mordecai O'Shaughnessy. And I was like, is that, is that, is it too much? It's so perfect. Mordecai is one of the characters in Purim. And uh, I, of the many last names there are out there, O'Shaughnessy just seemed like the one that went with Mordecai. I'm sorry. So, can I pause you? I'm new to Purim. This is my, my second year celebrating Purim with, with, my Jewish friends. Um, so can you tell me about Mordecai, please? I don't know anything oh, about that. Uh, so he's, um, I believe, the uncle that gets everything in motion in the book of Esther by, um, he, he adopted little Esther, who eventually becomes Queen Esther, who saves the Jews by being brave and being like, you're going to kill all the Jews? I'm a Jew. Start with me, King. Esther's and the King be like, like oh, no, favorite. I was wrong. Esther's my new favorite person. Like, I need a big poster of her or something. She's awesome. Uh, there's a gorgeous, gorgeous painting. Uh, I can't remember who it uh, Yeah, there's a there's a very famous, one of the pre-Raphaelites, maybe? Anyway. Um, I'm sorry for being so Gentile about all of this. but it, it's No, 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 no. no. I, I'm very Gentile myself. Um uh, but Mordecai is like the star simply because he gets everything moving and it actually became a, um, it's, it's only used in, in um, reference to Scandinavian and old, um, old Norse texts, but there's a word kenning, K-E-N-N-I-N-G. Um, so for Gaelic, Old Gaelic, Norse, and Old English myths, when you have a thing that, uh, Old German as well, um, when you have a thing that's just like a known metaphor, um, it's called a kenning. So the Rhine's belly, for example, shows up a bunch of times, and the Rhine's belly is a kenning for gold. Um, so I don't know if it's used in other mythological contexts. Anyway, long and the short of it is friend of Mordecai or um, uh, I can't remember the Hebrew right now, but basically it is a term for a trusted individual or friend. And that's how popular it became. So it's a very common middle name, even in modern, um, very, uh, um, 
secularized Jews. I have I have three friends with the middle name Mordechai. I mean, it's fun to say. That doesn't yeah. hurt. Yep. So the drink was um I don't... Mordecai O'Shaughnessy. Yes, Mordecai O'Shaughnessy. What's O'Shaughnessy? Oh, it's just the, the first uh, Irish last name that popped into my head. Love it. Okay, great. Drink. So, um, do, I actually don't know O'Shaughnessy. I assume it's related to the word John, which is where Sean comes from. Sounds uh, like it. Yeah. We love I, Sean. He's our son. Yeah, we love Sean. Yeah. Um, it's, oh, no. Now I'm going to go down that rabbit hole. Anyway, no, I'm not. I'm going to stick with the drink. So I, <laughs> unless you consider like an ounce of whiskey poured into a stout, I'm not a beer cocktail guy. I love my beer. It just is allowed to be what it is. But one of the things we always talk about is like mead is weird in that it's the one of the only beverages that's great by itself, by the pint, that also makes a great cocktail. And that's not because we're magicians. It's just that we have the idea of making mead, which naturally has those that characteristic. Some ciders as well. But yeah, the cider's still always so strong. It's like a cider drink with. Anyway, but one day I had a, it wasn't a Guinness. It was a locally made nitro stout. And I managed to get Valkyrie's Choice to float with that. And it's tough. Um, it doesn't want to float because they're both so dry. But I was able to get to float, and then the original what, version, had, like layered. No, I know. I never. Uh, okay, I'm trying. The original to version I'm gonna do it I poured black rum in. I know. And it made it core down the middle. Yeah, you use um, a spoon. Well, it's the the whole point is then I mixed it all up and it was great. But I decided not to go with a shot of rum because this is a 31 hour drinking period, and like we do not need to be putting shots of rum into Guinness at this hour, that's for later today. So yeah. it's a combination of Vonnie or Valkyries and ideally Nitro Guinness, if you can get your hands on it. Nitro Guinness. In, the best does that come in a can? I think it does, right? Yep. They, no, they, that's for Sam and I. That's what we have, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, uh, it's cool. a really cool I technology. I have meetings later, so I'm not going to make it now, but I will make it tonight with you guys. And... Um, Sam did mention before you came, Ricky, um, that that black and tan is not a great name for a drink, uh, and neither is Irish car bomb. So yeah, uh, I yeah. think what's that? Yeah, no, a lot of lot I didn't of. Know. I didn't, I'm so I'm such a bad. Nobody knows. Yeah. I I, just, I I it makes me irritated when I see it on like a St. Patty's Day menu or something. I'm like, that's kind of yeah, gross. Yeah. And also pinching people for not wearing green is very non-consensual. Don't do it. Don't um, do okay, I want to I want to just mention a couple of comments I'm seeing. I see hello Chris. Uh, Chris is going to Ireland in July, and he's excited. Hey, Chris, to long time to see no see. Food in Ireland, and then That's so cool, Chris. Um, there's so much the fish there, man. So hello to Samuel and Chris, and hello of course to Brian. Um, and Brian is hanging out in our Mediac Zoom all day, basically keeping the lights on so that anybody can hop in there. Um, oh. I'll put the link in our Mediac group. Um, the group link you have to join to enable to be, in order to be able to join the Zoom. Um, the group link is facebook.com slash group slash Mediacs. Um, and yeah, come hang out and drink with, with other Mediacs in the Zoom. Um, and I'll go put the link right now to the Zoom. And um, I'm going to let Sam talk a little bit more about what she's cooking because uh, thank you, Ricky, for the cocktail. There you thank you for the history asides. Oh, uh, Chris said, a oh, Jewish yeah. partner told me about the celebration in Israel. Sounds like a Bacchanal. Huh? Yeah, it's, yeah, it is a big, it is the only Jewish holiday in which you are supposed to become intoxicated. Although wine is associated with almost all Jewish holidays and you sometimes drink a lot of it, you are never supposed to become intoxicated except for this special occasion. That's awesome. Um, so my, my lamb is, is sufficiently braised. My dogs are going bananas <gasps> for it. And I swapped my I swapped my camera so you can actually see what I'm doing. So I put it in the bottom of my crock pot, and uh, 
don't come back to it. We'll come back to it in a minute. But um, I want to talk about boxy first because – oh, let me show you. See how it's, like, really, like – it's like doughy now instead of just mashed potatoes. So hungry. Guys. I know. I'm sorry. Can't handle it. So I'm going to grab like a big blob yeah. of it. And uh, the lamb has a lot of grease in it. So I'm going to use that as my oil. My red hook. Again, very small kitchen. Um, I'm going to use my lamb fat as the oil for the pan. And I always forget to buy buttermilk, so I made some buttermilk, which you can do with just like a cup of milk and a little bit of cream and tartar, a little bit of vinegar, or whatever. And I'm essentially just going to grab like a big wad of potato, and it's all like, it's all like goopy now, like really thick. I washed my hands, I promise. Um, but it doesn't really stick to your hands. I mean, it's okay. <laughs> That's true. That's true. You're not eating it. Um, it doesn't really stick to your hands anymore, like you would think like a fistful of potatoes would. So I'm just going to dunk it in the buttermilk, and then I'm going to fry it in the lamb fat, and then we're going to have a box tea. Now, one of the I... nice things about frying in lamb fat that uh, she didn't mention is it has one of the highest smoke points of all meat fats. <clears throat> I can't remember what it is. I think I think it's about 450, if I remember correctly. So that means yeah, it so has to be cool, a cooler fry? No, it's a warmer. You can go way hotter. So um, oh. if you're trying to fry in like tallow, tallow is like mid 300s. So it's below the temperature a lot of people would deep fry at. Um, yeah, so lamb fat, for reasons that are utterly beyond me, um, is particularly good for frying. But because there's so little of it in a lamb, uh, it's not really sold. You can't. You have to get it yourself. Yeah, there was a there a lot of it came out when I cooked yeah. this lamb haunch. Yeah, I think I. Uh, Chris is also a, a cook, so I don't know what his experience is with it. But um, I will admit, when I am braising, even if I know that what I'm cooking has like a huge fat content, I always prime my pan. Every time I think that I can just like, because I don't have enameled, I only have normal cast iron. Mm -hmm. um, but I always think like, oh yeah, the fat will take care of it. I always sear to the surface, which as Brian pointed out, is totally fine. Um, so oh, I will restart that for you, Brian. Um, and then you get the little crunchy bits on the bottom, which is the, the greatest thing about braising is scraping them back off. But yeah, lamb fat's great to work with. You just have to make it yourself. That's awesome. Um, so while the boxies are cooking, I'm going to put together my stew in my big crock pot over here. <clears throat> so Irish stew, all root vegetables and mushrooms. I got potatoes here, which, yeah, there's going to be double potatoes because I put, we put stew over the mashed potatoes as well, over the coal cannon. Um, I got mushrooms. And you want to layer it so, like, the thickest stuff is at the bottom. So I'm putting all of my potatoes on top of my meat. And then I'm going to put my carrots and then my onions and then my mushrooms. And if I have room, I'm going to put some cabbage on top. But I don't think I'm going to have room. That's going to be good. Yeah, I love a stew. You know me, I love a stew. Yeah. So, um, did you did you paint your apartment? Like, I love those I colors. Did, yeah. on the wall. Oh my god. I live in white walls, man. They don't care as long as I swap it back before I leave. That I know mine too, but that just sounds like so much work when I move. It was. We did it at our old place too, and it was a ton of work before we moved. But I was like, you know, we've lived here for five years, so it's like, I can't, I can't not do it. The onions are like big chunks, which is how you want it. You don't want them like diced. Everything should be like a big chunk. Big chunks. Big chunk. Oh my god, this is so cool. Um, so how universal is did you put carrots in? You did. I did, yeah. Sorry, I was I was I was typing something. I wasn't paying attention. So no, yeah, I got why is the combination of carrots and onions and what's the other thing? Uh celery. 
Oh yeah, celery. Why is that the trio? Uh, it is over. Uh, I think the earliest evidence we have for it is over two thousand years. Dang. Oh no! Like why? I, it's um, so good. I I know. I mean, I mean it, that's isn't why. that those are the three elements of mirepoix, right? Yeah. Um, they, I pretty certain that it goes uh it's roman so since it goes up and out of there carrots uh caramelize they have a huge sugar content yeah i mean they're everything in the allium family jess i know you and your allium thing um but i don't need to out you on a call yes i do <laughs> jess doesn't like garlic everybody i, want I don't I don't, but I do put it in my soups and stuff because it does add, it adds a special layer that nothing else can add to a soup. I'm, I'm growing 165 head of hardneck garlic. I will share some with you this year and see if it's like the. If it's better, if it doesn't well, leave the garlic taste in my mouth for four days. Yeah, it's completely, completely different character. Um, Really, really fun. And also the best thing about hardneck, two, no. The three best things about hardneck are one, they become a perennial really easily. So then you have these beautiful, crazy, tropical looking plants, but they're cold hardy. Yeah. Two, scapes. Garlic scapes. My single favorite food. I've heard um, that. When That's we get them. Word. Yeah. Uh, it's the neck and budding head. Um, when we get them, I will fry them up in butter and I will just eat them by themselves. That sounds um, delicious. The third thing, which I just learned and did not know, is unlike all that work with California garlic or soft neck variety, where you're like, shh, 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 there's paper everywhere, um, properly grown hard neck, almost all of the varieties, you could just be like, poop, paper, poop, paper. It's great. It does sound better. Um, yeah, um, my guess is simply that the three characteristics hit such major flavor categories you've got sweetness millard reaction and that sort of like earthy grassiness from and that's another thing that upsets me that i live i was like 32 years old before i had proper celery i'd only had stuff from the grocery store and everyone's like oh it's so much better when you grow it yourself and i'm like yeah I mean, usually tomatoes yes like big difference but if you're growing beef steak they're pretty similar to what you get at the grocery store celery that's been grown and not blanched for shape and color is a completely different food it's it tastes more like um parsley than any celery i've ever had huh yeah and so where's celery native to that in europe yeah uh i think cel celery is related to the word salt um i think i could be wrong about that um which would also make it related to the word for salad and uh salary are carrots native to Europe? Yeah, they're, uh, Is anything native to Europe? Um, oh, so I looked up. Celery literally comes from the word for parsley. I did not know that. Parsley. Uh, when I said this. So, yeah, as I said, it tastes more like parsley than anything else. Hold on. We have to watch this. Did you put it in already? No, I didn't. It's exploding everywhere. The ceremonial. Um, Chris says, I started cooking on fat recently, and it's not entirely straightforward. For example, I got... A I got quarry of A5 Kobe and nothing that comes from cooking in it isn't greasy. Brisket and ribeye trim, on the other hand, is amazing. Huh. Yeah. Wagyu has the highest level of um, fat inclusion, muscular fat inclusion. Oh, he oh. said Wagyu, not Kobe. He corrected. Yeah, but it's, it's all uh, same. same uh, the marble. Yeah. It's, it's madness. I saw that, Sam. Thank you for tilting the camera. That was juicy. I liked it. You're welcome. Is that something we're allowed to say live on here? Oh, yeah. We're allowed to say whatever you want. Nobody's watching. <gasps> the pint with is here. Pint Hello. So I just heaped like a ton of spices on top of this, like parsley and thyme and garlic. And then I'm just pouring uh, beef stock in Guinness, just all of it in. You don't want to like fill it up all the way because it's going to get, the veggies are going to give a lot of juice off. Oh, thanks, Pilot. Glad you're here. Um, yeah, a pint with says thank you for sharing your recipe, Sam. That's really nice. But I'm going to go get another can of Guinness. 
so Sam is working from her memory and her uh, her recipe, but we also have some recipes um, linked to our blog that are mm -hmm. to other blogs. Um, so go give our blog some traffic. Go give those other blogs some traffic uh, if you want to see the recipe written down yep. for what Sam's doing here. Yeah. yeah and I want to give a shout out to the, the hamantaschen recipe we shared yesterday. She's amazing and she's my go-to resource. That one was a good recipe, although it, it that recipe required three hours in the fridge, which I did not have. So I looked for um, a quick, quick and easy hamantaschen, which they turned out wonderful, although they didn't have butter, which was uh, surprising. <laughs> I know. What did they have? It occurred to me afterwards. I was like, I think butter is a pretty crucial component of this. Uh, vegetable oil. So I used canola. Huh. Um, but they, were, they tasted great. So please have hamantaschen after your lamb stew. Um, we linked the hamantaschen recipe, the lamb stew recipe. Um, and what else? What other recipes do we have going on here? We got boxes. Um, I'm going to show the boxy off. Oh, the box. Yes. Oh, it smells so good, you guys. Oh, Look at your tartan plates, you cutie. I know. My grandpa gave them to but yeah, they're just uh, amazing little cakes of love. And uh, I actually oh, it looks like a eat. heart. I love it. It does. Nora, it does kind of, doesn't it? Anything that's vaguely that shape, Nora's like, it's a heart. Aw, um, that's so cute. Ryan, I'm back on. You should be able to get back in. I think I'm on the right one. Um, I am really lazy and I put my box cheese in the waffle iron and that makes them so much crispier. I freaking love that. Last night when I was getting ready for the Purim thing, I had a meeting leading up to it. The power had been out and I was like, what can I make in 15 minutes? Anyone who's on that call knows that I cook everything like from scratch from scratch these days. And I ended up pan searing chunks of tofu and shoving them in the air fryer to finish crisping. Yeah. And I just went off to my meeting and, um, you know, 15 minutes in, I came and I plated them. Oh my God. I love this. The waffle iron. Yeah. I, I waffle iron everything. I'm going to make, like, I bought this $30 waffle iron. I'm going to make her work. Like, we make pizza in it. We make uh, quesadillas. We put uh, cinnamon rolls in it. It's, it's can you, can you show it off? What kind of waffle iron does all these things? It's just oh. a waffle iron, man. I think okay. we need to work on the Zoom settings uh, after this. Because yeah. uh, it's saying the host is in another meeting. Yeah. I tried to sign in through Kelly's account. Um, Brian, we'll have you uh, coordinate with. Yeah, just one of the. Wow, 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 yeah, wow. I'm wow. just gonna use the other Zoom link for this for the yeah. for the media hangout. Yep. Um, Brian, I'm gonna use the normal the normal media. Zoom, let me get the link. And send it. I haven't ended my subscription yet. We're gonna switch. We're gonna switch to this other one, but it sounds like we need to have it have some settings adjusted. All right, we got like ten minutes. Let's make some bread. Yeah, I was gonna ask about the bread. What's yeah. the bread called again? Blah. Oh my god, so okay. good. So she was basically done. I put it on high um and cook it for like six hours. I usually turn it down to medium or low after like three hours. But um so, I'm about to jump, folks. But I'll okay. see you again a little after one. But I haven't told anyone about my crazy experiment. Um please don't try this at home. It is, it is in the middle of the third day. I'm going to go grab it because Sam and I were talking last week about what people really ate in Ireland versus what ended up here. So what we know of as corned beef is basically ham spices applied to beef. The history is a little bit lost, a little muddy, but it probably has to do with the ghettos that were inhabited by both Irish and Jewish immigrants where they couldn't have ham, which was very traditional but I found something that was made and I spent over three hours trying to find someone who has made it just so one person would be like, you will make this and it will not kill your family. I have not found someone who says this. So I'm going to go grab it and I'll be right back. I'm so excited. So with these blobs that you just add a big blob of butter to them and then you start adding flour. Like they're they're really like the easiest bread you could possibly want to make. Um, they come from Waterford, which is in like southeast Ireland. I 
know if I can oh, I'm gonna pour hot grease on my computer. Uh-oh. Yeah, I'm not. So this started out. Oh, I bet if I tilt my camera, hold on. This started out filling the entire pan. Dang. It has been slow. So I salted it and started dehydrating it at 170 degrees with a fan going three days ago. This is how I found out that my oven has an auto shut off after 10 hours. Oh, shit. So I kept having to like jump up and get the fan going again. So it would stay at safe temperatures. I know that this product is still made in Europe because I've had it. But basically what happens is you've made a massive, massive, massive piece of beef jerky. And what you do is you take slices of it whenever you want it. And so if you wanted to throw it in a dish, like a stew, you have something that's basically your beef and your bouillon all in one with no cooking, no prep. So people throughout Europe and even in, from what I can tell, modern day Ireland, some traditional families will still make this and use it like ramen. They'll throw a couple chunks in, throw boiling water on top, throw some potatoes in, and dinner is done in like 15 minutes. So I was hoping it would be ready to try on this call. Mm. I, there's no way to tell because I can't find a single goddamn recipe. Yeah. So anyway, I love you all, and I will see you in a little bit. Thank you for spending time. Bye. Bye. Thanks for coming. We're almost done. I'm just going to get this squaw dough together. But you and I have made dough on camera before, or bread dough, Jessica. Yeah. This is like the easiest possible rolls you could make. It's just fat, a uh, little bit of sugar, salt, and flour, and yeast. Okay, I think I've got the post okay. uh, corrected for the correct Zoom link. So if you guys want to come hang out with Brian all day, um, Brian's one of our kind of head mediacs. Um, he attends most of our events um, and he's a brewer. So he gives a lot of homebrew advice um, to me too. <laughs> I'm the worst. I'm, I'm, I'm the middleest. I'm the most average. Yeah. Um, by the way, you guys want to see my tea mead from yesterday? I was gonna. I, it looks pretty gross, but it's delish. It's got some floaters. <laughs> Those are bags. I want it. I want it. I think I want to do it properly. Where like I'm gonna let it settle and then I'm gonna siphon it from the top and bottle uh -huh. it. Um, I still haven't identified the tea bags I used because I ripped the labels off, of course. But. I think I can probably figure it out from what the tea that I have in the house and the smell. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry for uh, hijacking your cooking. No, it's fine. I was interested uh, after you told me about it yesterday. I was it's so good. Mm -hmm. I'll save you some. I'm going to save, I'm okay. going to bottle some and I'll save it for you. It's, it's the best I've ever done. I really don't know what I did right. That's the thing. I need to start being better at keeping a journal for all this stuff. Or at Yeah, least, like, we're pretty bad things. about it too. Like we, we have good intentions, but uh, yeah. often, often forget. Yeah. Down. It's better to have meat, mystery mead than no mead. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Chris says, I heard that corned beef and cabbage, as we know, is likely a Welsh dish. We were actually talking about that earlier in the call. Uh, the first mention of it was from a 12th, the first mention that we know was from a 12th century Irish poem, um, but it was talking about uh, bacon that had been cooked in or preserved in honey. They called it corned beef, but it was actually bacon. Isn't that interesting? Uh, they didn't eat, like I, I mentioned to Jessica, I think Jessica was like the only person here at the time, but they didn't eat a lot of beef in Ireland. There wasn't a lot of room for cows. Um, so that's most beef Irish meals, like like cottage pies and corned beef are Irish American food. Do you um, know why it's called corned beef? Because it's, it's how they preserve it. I don't know exactly how they do it. Ricky probably knows, but... Um, it's it's like it's like preserved in salt or something like that, and that's what makes huh. that's what gives it its unique flavor. Okay. 
so I'm going to show off the blah dough since uh, this is going to rise and I got to knead it, um, which I'm not going to do on screen because it'll take like forever. This is kind of what it looks like. Mm. Yes. And um, you can see pictures of what it will become on the, the blah recipe page. But um, that's, that's kind of it. We kind of have everything ready and cooking and now you just, you just sit and wait. So after that rises, or is it uh -huh. rising? Uh, it's got, I got to knead it first. I'm, cause I'm lazy. I'm using my bread hook. So yeah. That's that what I do. Camera, yeah. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Um, so knead it. And then how long? Yeah, for rising? Uh, like 30 minutes or so. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. It's and not, then little balls in yeah. the baking dish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they, they make delicious little rolls. Could you do a big bread with it if you wanted to? I don't see why not. Brined. Autumn says corned beef is brined. I just wonder why it's called corned. Like that's so. I don't know. I don't know. There's no corn involved. Know. It confused me so much when I was a kid. I was expecting this like beef mixed with corn. Mm -hmm. More on that. If we ever find out, we'll update everyone. <laughs> I have we'll no idea. We'll Brian probably knows. Everywhere. Um, Okay, cool. So we're going to wrap this one up. We'll be back at one o'clock with our brewers. They have something special planned. Um, they're going to, I think, show off some of their um, brew experiments. There's an experiment room at the brewery uh, mm -hmm. where we do, I guess, one gallon to five gallon experiments. Um, and our packing line manager, Jake, is also a brewer, but he's also it, he's really into fermentation. He's also really into foraging and mushrooms and that kind of stuff. And his brain is just kind of on like wild things. So uh, I'm excited to hear what he has to say. Uh, we'll put a link for that later. It'll be similar to how these links were released for this event. Um, but yeah, come come be a mediac if you're not. Um, and hang out in the Zoom today if you are a mediac. Uh, and I will talk to Sam soon and all of you guys soon. Thank you so much for cooking with us. Thank um, you guys. yeah, if you guys cook something for, for tonight or, um, any other night, please share it with us. We want to see your recipes in the media X group. Um, if you're on YouTube in the comments on the YouTube video, that's going to be available after this. Um, yeah, we love sharing recipes and mm -hmm. love giving you guys credit for your recipes and, uh, it's just fun. Corning is a form of curing. It has nothing to do with corn. Okay. Coarse corns of salt. That ah, thank you, Brian. Yeah, I knew Brian would know. Um, <coughs> okay. Cool, guys. Thank Thanks so much. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Sam. We'll see you guys Bye. soon. Bye. Bye.